Petty. The name in NASCAR circles means royalty. From the patriarch of the racing family, Lee, to the king himself, Richard, NASCAR's winningest driver, and his son, Kyle, the family name has been at the forefront of the sport for more than four decades. Today, Vibland Sports, in conjunction with Vibland Media, proudly present a conversation with Kyle Petty, racer, owner, CEO, and philanthropist. <laughs> And on today's bonus edition of iBland Sports, we welcome in Kyle Petty of the Petty Racing family. Kyle, how are you, my friend? Doing great, man. Doing great. There's so much to talk about with you. I'm going to talk a little bit about your racing career, but I want to talk more about your charity that you're involved in. First of all, was there a lot of pressure growing up on you, not so much from your granddad and your dad, but just being uh, born a Petty uh, in the NASCAR racing world? You know what? If there was, I didn't pay attention to it. Uh, maybe I should have paid attention to it. Maybe that maybe, maybe that would have been better. But you know what? I grew up in rural North Carolina, uh, and I tell people this all the time. Uh, everybody where we lived were dairy farmers, tobacco farmers, uh, chicken farmers, and there was tons of fourth, fifth, sixth generation farms that I grew up around. We just happened to raise race cars. That, that was the kind of farm we had. So it was nothing to go into the family business. So following my grandfather and following my dad into the family business, man, that's what everybody did. Um, so it was just a natural progression for me. It just happened to be that we were racing. Your grandfather, Lee, he was one of the true pioneers in NASCAR. Tell us a little bit about him because a lot, a lot of people may think as much of him as they know about your father and even yourself. Yeah, you know, he, look, he, he started racing because he can make a living doing it. And, and that, that pretty much sums up Lee Petty. Um, he was the first uh, stock car driver to make a straight living driving a race car. Everybody else worked a side business or had another business or, or did something else. And, you know, he realized that um, in, the, in the late 40s and about the time NASCAR had come along, that if you ran up front and you run in the top two or three and your stuff didn't break and you took care of your stuff and, and you won your fair share of, of races, you could make a decent living out of it. So um, that was a big deal. That was a big deal. I think guys like Buck Baker and the flocks and all those guys, they always looked at him like he was a little odd because all he did was drive a race car where they had other businesses and stuff. And, you know, he won 54 races, won three championships and, uh, did a lot in a pretty short period of time. Didn't start racing until he was 34, 35, 36 later in his life. Um, because before that he did have a regular job. He had to have a regular job, put food on the table, but Eventually, racing put food on the table. I'm sure people in the racing circuit uh, give him his dues, but just in general, maybe the average sports fan, do you feel like your granddad doesn't get the appreciation, maybe even the respect that he deserves because he was a pioneer and he was so successful? That's a good question. You know, I think people that know the sport obviously uh, understand that. And, and, and uh, but you know, here, here's the thing, and I don't care whether it's, I don't care what sport we're talking, I don't care what business we're talking. Um, I, you know, I, I, I look today and think about the astronauts that landed on the moon. And I think, man, they don't get their due, man. They, nobody realizes how big a deal that was, uh, to put people on the moon. Um, when, when kids look at it now, and I think it's the same way in sports, man. Uh, people look at the sport and they see Kyle Busch and they see Jimmy Johnson and they see, you know, Ryan Blaney and, and, and Chase Elliott and these guys, and they, they don't know who. Tim and Fonnie Flockhart. They don't know who Red Byron, who won the first NASCAR race was. They don't know, uh, you know, who Buck Baker was and who Lee Petty was. And that's okay. You don't have to know the history of the sport uh, to, to, to appreciate the sport. Um, but it's good to, to know a little bit about where the sports come. But I don't, I don't think any of those old guys in any sport get the credit they deserve. When I listened to you talk about a month, month and a half ago, Kyle, you said there was a big difference between your grandfather and your father and how they went about viewing the task at hand. Your grandfather was all about making a living. Your dad was about winning races. Is that correct? Yeah, my, my dad was all about trophies, man. He didn't care how much it paid. Um, it could have paid nothing as long as they gave a nice trophy. <laughs> then, then, <laughs> then he was going to drive twice as hard. Uh, to get the trophy. And, and that's what it was all about for him. So I, I, it's, it's two totally different perspectives. And, and I think that comes again, like I said, my grandfather um, had been a mechanic, had been in the trucking business, had been in a number of businesses. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh my gosh, I can make a living driving a race car. 
this is just another business to me. To Richard Petty, um, it was a sport. It was the way he grew up. Uh, my grandfather was about 12 or 13 years old when my dad started driving. So that's all he had known his dad really ever did was drive a race car. So for him, it was the passion of the sport. It was the passion of the cars. It was being at the racetrack. It was understanding what was going on there. So it, he had a totally different approach than what my granddad did. And as good as your dad was on the Oval, I think maybe his greatest legacy is how he is with the fans. I mean, he is a great, great ambassador of the sport. Yeah, you know, and always has been, always has been. But but here's what I tell people. I think the reason for that is um, that he's a fan. He is a fan. And, and somewhere in his brain, you know, he thinks there before the grace of God go, I, I could have just been sitting in the third row watching somebody else do it. But I was just in the right place at the right time, born into the right family and blessed enough to go do this. And I appreciate the opportunity that I was given. And I think that's the way he looks at it. Um, so I always laugh when when people say, you know, he he stayed, he signed autographs. He's a fan favorite man. He was the biggest fan. Um, and I think that's what, that what's, that's what puts him in that category. Kyle Petty is our guest here on this bonus edition of Vibland Sports, a presentation of Vibland Media. Kyle, when you look back at your own racing career, um, do you have regrets? Are you pleased with the way it went? Nah, look, look here, here's the one thing you learn racing. Okay. And I will say this, um, and that's the best part about racing, um, is, is when Sunday comes and you run a race at midnight. It, it becomes Monday and that's another week and you never look back. You just look forward because there's another race. And, and you know what? I, I did things a little unorthodox uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, I started my own team. I drove for the Wood Brothers when they were just starting to, to run the full schedule. I started for Felix when he was just starting team. I seemed to be the guy that was um, a starter, never a closer, just a starter. Uh, so I started a lot of teams and did a lot of stuff. But you know what? Uh, the best friends I have in the world are in the sport. The best people I know are in the sport. I won some races, um, had contended for championships, never won a championship, but contended for championships. So no, I don't have any regrets. Uh, if I, if, if I could go back, I'd do it all probably the same way. Eight career wins, Kyle. Is there that one that you didn't win that you think back, man, that was right there for the taking? No, not really. Um, you know, I, I think, I think that's one of those things where, you know, golly, man, I run 800 races, 800 and some odd races. God, I, I can't remember the last race I run, much less one that got away. Um, so it's it's funny. I don't I don't think about things like that because I think if you dwell on things like that, that's looking back. Um, and you know what? There, I had opportunities. Sometimes I capitalized on them. Sometimes I didn't. Sometimes I just made mistakes flat up. That's what that's that that happened. Um, and in the end, it is what it is, and you move on to the next chapter in your life. At what point does a race car driver know that it's time for his career to be over? You know what? I don't think they do know. Um, I think race car drivers have, have, and I think all great athletes have that, that in, innate ability or, or a, a, defla- a flaw in their gene that says you can do this forever. Um, they just believe they're going to be the greatest for, you know, you, you go talk to, um, to, I'm sure you go talk to Michael Jordan or, or Palmer and Nicholas and, and those guys, you know, when they were 10 or 15 years out and they still thought they could probably play golf and play as good as they had ever played because mentally you never let go of that. You never, ever let go of that. Physically, your body goes in a different direction. So that that's the trick with a race car driver. A race car driver is when, when your physical ability matches your mental aptitude for the sport and what you've learned in the sport. Uh, and some guys just run through that peak and they have a couple of good years and some guys stay there for seven or eight years and some guys stay there uh, for 10 or 12 years. Like, and those are the greats. Those are the Richard Petty's and the Dale Earnhardt's and the Jeff Gordon's and the Jimmy Johnson's and the Kyle Bush's. Those are the greats of the sport who are able to keep that, the, the same constantly learn, constantly get better, but at the same time, not lose that physical ability. At that point, when did you realize for Kyle Petty enough was enough? Because as you said, it comes in differing degrees and stages for every driver. Well, this is the, this is the Kyle Petty story, and I'll give it to you in a nutshell. That I had planned on retiring pretty much in 2001, um, and then when my son was killed in 2000, uh, then honestly to keep the business alive and to keep the business viable and up and running. Um, then I had to switch my brain back on and go back to being a race car driver. And I think once you make that commitment that you're not going to do something, 
you're never 100 percent, even if you never get out of a car, even if you never stop playing basketball, even if you never stop playing golf. You're just not 100 percent because you've lost that spark a little bit. You cut the pilot light off. You can't just cut it back on. Um, so I, I think for me, I had planned on retiring really in about 80 or excuse me, in about 2001. That would have been Adam's first full year. Um, and, um, you know, it just didn't work out that way. So I hung around for another seven or eight years. So I, I would have to go back and say I knew probably eight or 10 years before I ever got out of a car uh, that I should have been out of a car. But I had to stay in a car for for other reasons. It's obviously a very dangerous sport. So in the back of your mind, you have to think, don't you, a little bit about your own mortality every time you get in that car? No, I don't think you do. Uh, even when it hits close to home, like Adam, uh, I, don't, I don't think you ever do. Um, and again, I go back to the, my flawed gene theory, uh, where there's something in our DNA that's just a little bit of a tick off <laughs> that allows you to put it in a place and never think about it, really. Uh, I mean, you don't wake up at three o'clock in the morning in a cold sweat. You don't think about it uh, when you're when you're in the middle of a crash. You don't think about it when the crash is over. You just move on to the next week. And, um, you know, you know, it's dangerous. I, I've lost friends. I've lost family. Uh, I lost my uncle to the sport, my mother's brother when I was 14 years old. Um, so, I mean, I, and I've been been in races and and been around people who started a race and never finished. So, you know, it, it's it's always there. Um, but I, I think for it's some, for some reason you, you just, you don't become immune to it, but you just get used to it being, um, having a chair at the table, uh, and you acknowledge it and you treat it with respect, but you don't worry about it too much. Kyle Petty is our guest on this bonus edition of Vibe Land Sports. Kyle, I want you to tell in its entirety the story that you shared here in Oklahoma a month or a month and a half ago. We're talking about mortality. You actually thought you had died on the track in Indianapolis in 1996. <laughs> it's one of the funniest stories I think I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, we were running good. We were, we were, um, they put some things down on the, on the inside of the racetrack to keep us from running through the grass because with a 36, 3,700 pound stock car at the time, the only way to really get it to turn was to run through the grass and, and get it to almost spin, to get it sideways and then power back up and drive up off the corners, kind of like driving dirt to some some degree. And, um, you know, we were running pretty good, and they had put this stuff down on the inside of the racetrack or in the grass. And if you ran over it, um, it, it got out on the racetrack, and you could run over it on the racetrack, and there were pieces of metal, and you'd cut a tire. Well, I was running second to Johnny Benson and cut a tire coming through turn four, and bounced off the outside and it hit a ton, man, hit a ton. Cause you're, you're running pretty good at that point in time, probably 160, 70 miles an hour. So you, you hit pretty good and, uh, bounced off and come back across the racetrack and, you know, trying to catch my breath, I got hit again. Uh, and Sterling mm -hmm. Marlin hit, he hit me right in the, in the left front tire and in the, in the door and it knocked me out. And, and then my car went back and hit the outside wall again, mm -hmm. then came back and hit the inside wall. Uh, and came to rest driver's side next to the inside wall. But I was, I was knocked out. And like I told that night, and like I've told a million times when you've had surgery and you've been put under um, and you're coming to, you can kind of hear people around you and you think you're coming to, and, but you're not really, you're still in that dream state. And, you know, I, I began to think I was coming to and think I could hear people and I'm trying to move my legs. I'm trying to move my arms and nothing moves. And, you know, I just start praying that I'm alive and, but I can't move anything. You know, I can't move, move anything, but I can't really make out what anybody's saying. And, you know, this goes on for what seems like an eternity. And finally I realized that, that I'm not alive, that, that I must be dead. So I start praying really, really fast that if I am dead, then when, whenever, whenever I do am able to move and am able to see again, because I know you will be, uh, that I'm standing there in, in front of St. Peter at the, at the golden gate, uh, at the pearly gates. And that, uh, that he's going to let me in. And I, I said, I told you guys then, I said, I'm praying that prayer. And all of a sudden I hear Sterling Marlin talking and I go back to, <laughs> to praying that I'm, I'm alive again, because I know if Sterling Marlin's the same place I'm at, we're not in heaven. We've gone somewhere else. <laughs> we, we, we've gone somewhere else. And sure enough, they had to cut me out of the car. And that's the crazy part was they cut me out of the car and they couldn't get me around to the ambulance. So they had to lay me up on a, put me on a backboard with, um, one of those neck braces on and strapped me to this backboard so I wouldn't move because I wasn't sure what was wrong and um, set me up on top of the thing there. And I, I laid there for a while and they moved the car and then they set me down on the ground and then they rolled over a stretcher and they picked me up. Sterling said that I, I was still in and out of it at this time. Sterling said I screamed like a girl and they put me back down. They picked me up again. I screamed like a girl and 
finally Sterling said he had to tell him if you if you quit standing on Kyle's ponytail, he'll quit screaming because <laughs> they had my my hair was so long then it, it kind of hung on the ground and the, the paramedic was standing on my hair and even though I was knocked out, it hurt bad enough I guess that it, that it made me scream. So that that was my Indianapolis story and I came out with you know I don't know three or four broken ribs, dislocated shoulder. I had a bunch of crack stuff. Nothing really broke, just a lot of crack stuff, so it was okay. How many surgeries do you know you've had? You know, I, I've, I've been very fortunate. I've only had, like, uh, uh, I had a compound fracture in my left femur and a crushed hip, and then I broke my hand once um, and had to have a pin and a plate and some stuff put in it. But those are really the only surgeries, man. But I've broken ankles and broken fingers and cracked ribs and broken collarbones, dislocated collarbones and broke scapulas and, cracked vertebrae and all that stuff. But man, there's no surgery for that. You just got to, the only thing that works for stuff like that is you got to get back in the car the next week and go drive. And that's what oh, wow. we used to do. We were just crazy enough to do it. So have you had fewer surgeries than your dad? Oh yeah. 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 But for sure. But you know why? He's only had a couple. Um, it's, it's a funny sport. You break a lot of stuff. You know, I, I he wrecked a Pocono in, uh, I guess mid eighties and, we all went to the hospital and as soon as the race was over with, cause they had him over there and the doctor asked us and <laughs> the doctor's like, well, what, what happened the last time he broke his neck? And we were like, what do you mean the last time we didn't know he'd ever broke his neck. <laughs> and the doctor said, Oh yeah, it's been broke before pretty good. And it's broke again. We're going to have to put him in a, in a, in a neck brace. And the funny part was, uh, six days later, we're at Talladega and he's in a car and he starts to race, uh, with a broke neck. Now he only run 10 or 15 laps and he got out. Um, but that's, that's the way those guys were. They were tough. They were tough guys. Kyle Petty is our guest here on this bonus edition of Vibland Sports. Kyle, your favorite racetrack. You know what I tell people, and this is true, um, and, and, and I say it a little bit tongue-in-cheek to begin with, my favorite racetrack is Daytona because there's a beach there, and that's the only <laughs> place we ever went when I was a kid where you saw the, the, the ocean. Everywhere else, you just went to a racetrack somewhere. But honestly, Daytona is uh, because Daytona is – is where our sport really found itself. Uh, Darlington was our first super speedway in the 50s, and most of the racetracks in the 50s were, you know, small dirt tracks and, and things like that. But Daytona, when they built that two-and-a-half-mile high-banked oval, uh, that put stock car racing. Uh, that made the people in Detroit. That made the Chryslers and, and the Chevys and, and the Ford people stand up and take notice, and all of a sudden the manufacturers poured into the sport. And uh, the 60s and on into uh, – to the early seventies was the heyday in the sport. Uh, and it was because of Daytona. Daytona drove that interest. So, uh, and there's so much history there, man. You, you don't, you, you didn't used to, you can now it's a little bit of a fluke sometimes to win Daytona. But if I go back to, to the late nineties, man, to win Daytona was a huge, huge deal. Uh, those first 40 or 50 years. Is NASCAR as a sport, Kyle, as healthy as it was, let's say five or 10 years ago in popularity? Well, it's healthier than it was five or 10 years ago. Um, and, and, but you go back to five or 10 years before that and it was out the, out the roof, man. Right. Uh, but nobody, but nobody knew why, you know, you go back to 2004, five, six, right along there. Nobody knew why, but you know, the recession, our, our sport is driven by outside dollars. It's driven by sponsorship dollars. Um, you know, and, and when, when you take a company that's not doing the business, uh, that it should be doing the first place they're going to cut, uh, are the fringe. Uh, and the fringe is a, having a race car, having your name on a race car is not, doesn't, it, doesn't necessarily make that product fly off the shelf or help you expand your business. So um, it's, it's like buying a billboard to some degree and integrating that into your marketing platform. And marketing gets cut, cut a lot of times. So the, we've gone through a lot of years uh, where it, it's kind of fallen off. But I think in the last couple of years, TV ratings have stabilized. Attendance is still not where we want it. But having said that, Having said that, and I tell this to people all the time, and I just watched the race at Bristol, and people are screaming. They're like, did you see the attendance at Bristol? There was nobody there. You're right. There's only like 85,000 people there. Um, so there was nobody there. The place seats 160. So when you take a place that seats 160 and put 85,000 in, it's going to look empty. Nothing I can full. do about that. You know, that that is just a visual. It is half full, but 85,000 is more – than most stadiums, football, basketball, baseball hold anywhere. So it's, it's, we still draw pretty good crowds. Ratings are still good. Uh, and I think, you know, with, with a Chase Elliott, with a Ryan Blaney, with a Daniel Suarez, uh, with a William Byron, with, uh, you know, these guys that are coming along, um, the sport's going through a little bit of a, a change. 
uh, with their drivers, but there's a lot of young drivers that are in the mix that um, are going to make make waves in this sport for years to come. 15 or 20 years ago, when it was a renaissance period for NASCAR, was there, in your opinion, an overexpansion of racetracks because it seemed like they were popping up all over the country? Well, that's a that's a really good question. I think, st- and I'm, I'm not sure that the answer to that 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 there is an answer. I think I think history will tell. Um, and, and the reason I say that is because we raced at places like Rockingham, North Carolina, North Wilkesburg, North Carolina. Uh, we raced at, 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 at Nashville, Tennessee. We raced so many different short tracks and little places around in the Southeast. They traded those places in for a Chicago. Uh, they traded those places in, uh, for a Kansas city. They traded those places in for other racetracks. Now in the end, it's tough to really tell because you've exposed us to, to a bigger market uh, to more of a major league market, cities where they have NFL teams and NBA teams and major league baseball teams where they have major golf tournaments. Uh, so you, you've taken your sport and put it in front of the public um, in, in some major markets. How have they accepted it? They've accepted it. They've not overwhelmingly accepted it, but they've accepted it. So it depends on whether we can build on top of that. If not, then you have to say, yeah, that was a bad time in the sport. But right now, I think the verdict's still out on that. There's absolutely nothing of the the sport that you haven't done. You, of course, as I said earlier, have eight wins. You uh, race for some of the biggest names as far as owners are concerned. You ran your family's business for a long, long time, and you've also been a car owner. What's the thing you're most proud of as far as your contribution to the sport of racing? You know what? That's a good question. Um, Never really thought about it, to to be honest with you. I was just – you know, I, I, th- I think all sports, and I will say this, all sports um, have superstars. Uh, they have guys that, that sit on the bench, and then they just have journeymen. Guys that are in there every play, every race, uh, every shot at a golf tournament. But you know what? The only place you're going to find them is when you look at the final rundowns or you look in the record book or you look at who was on a team roster that year because they just they're just there. And sometimes I kind of look at myself like that. I was just a journeyman who went through the thing. I think the biggest thing uh, when I look back at the sport was in 95 when we started doing the Cal Petty Charity Ride Across America. Um, and we started started our foundation and started uh, a short five years later, six years later, and incorporated Victory Junction Camp and, and built the camp eventually. Uh, there was not any drivers uh, at that time who had who – had, a philanthropic arm to who they were, a foundation for who they were. Uh, and I remember right after that talking to Jeff Gordon, I remember sitting down with Jimmy Johnson and talking to him about starting his, his, um, his foundation. So I think for me, the biggest thing that, that people will probably remember Kyle for was, Hey, that's that crazy guy that rode that motorcycle across country and built that camp for kids. (laughs) Um, that's, that's that guy. Uh, and after he did that, then other drivers, you know, kind of said, Hey, that's something we can do too. And, uh, I think that's probably, uh, in the end, you'll probably be remembered more for, for changing or adding that to the, to the landscape of what the sport is more than anything else. I want to turn back the page to 2000 when you, you lose your son, Adam, obviously, you know, that that can happen, Kyle, uh, in that, that line of work, but that is an unthinkable tragedy for a parent. You should never have to bury your son. Take us through finding that out and then how you guys decided, Hey, I'm going to use this tragedy to benefit other people. You know, I, I was I was with my daughter. We were in Europe, um, had just landed and got a phone call from Mike Helton. And he told me that Adam had been in an accident. And then he called back not long and said that he hadn't made it. So we just turned around and came back. Um, and, and, and it, you know, I spoke about it earlier. That's something you never think about. You don't think it's you put it in a box and it's never going to touch your life or it's never going to touch you that close. But it did. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think just being. It amazed me when it happened. Um, you're stunned. You don't know which way to turn. You don't know what to do. You don't. You don't. You don't know anything. Um, but I was. I was touched and amazed by by the outreach from so many fans, from so many people that my life and my path had crossed through the years, and uh, that reached out and you know with condolences. And uh, we had talked. And it's funny. Adam and I had ridden motorcycles a million times together. And uh, we had ridden to a camp in Florida and done some stuff, and I had been fortunate and driven a car with Paul Newman and some sports car races, and 
uh, it's like as soon as the accident happened, we knew that's what we were going to do. We were going to build a camp. Um, that this was what we were going to do with his legacy. This was going to be the legacy of of who he was, a 19 year old kid who had who had visited children's hospitals, been to children's hospitals, done so much with Sprint in a short period of time to connect children's hospitals um, through through their websites and through their things. Um, that that's what we were going to do, and that's what we did. Uh, and you're right, no parent should ever. It, it puts nature out of order. You know, a, a tree grows and a tree gets to be really old. And that tree dies, but there's a young tree coming along after it. The young tree doesn't die first. Uh, and that's kind of no matter what, what, whether it's the animal kingdom or the plant kingdom, it doesn't make any difference. It changes nature's order uh, when, the, when the young go first. So, um, But you know what? You, you just focus on, on the positives. And I, I tell people we could choose to be extremely bitter or choose to be blessed. And we chose to be blessed um, because uh, the sport had been good to us. Uh, my grandfather had almost been killed in 61, uh, but hadn't. Uh, my dad had been in a million accidents. I'd been in a million accidents and always walked away. And you thought you, you begin to think that you can walk away. And one time you don't. And then it makes you regroup and think again. And you think, OK, what can I do to be better? And uh, We jumped on board with NASCAR with a lot of their safety initiatives and helped them. And we were building cars specifically just to go out to Nebraska and be crashed at a test track out there so people could understand what crashes did and what they were all about. So, um, you know, I, I think it, it changes your perspective on life, but at the same time, it gives you an opportunity and you have to look at it as an opportunity. Uh, I, I don't, I don't think that anything happens that you can't find the answer in the Bible. And I don't think that anything happens that, that God puts on you that you can't handle in some way, shape or form. Um, if you look at it from, from the right perspective, you can't look at it with your head down the whole time. You can't look at it in the darkness. You have to turn on a light somewhere and look at it. Uh, and I think that's what we did. And we built a camp and I tell people we've seen almost 30,000 kids have come through that camp. And in the last 15 years, this is our 15th anniversary for victory junction. Uh, it took us three or four years to get it up and running. Um, but every, every kid that leaves that camp, I see Adam smile on their face and I know he's still here with us. Do you ever think now 19 years removed from that horrible, horrible day, you ever find yourself thinking that at what, 38 years old, what my son would be like and what type of racing career he would have had? No, no, no. I told you earlier, I don't look back. Um, I'm always looking forward, man. I'm always looking forward to a rear view mirror in my car is a waste of time. Um, because you, you can't. You, I, I don't think anybody can. I, I think if you continue to look back, you need to learn from your mistakes and you analyze your mistakes and you look at them on that day and you learn from them and you learn from them in, in that period of time. But you don't look back 20 years and say, man, I made a mistake. If I'd done this, this would have happened. And, and, you know, we can't rewrite history. So many people in this country want to rewrite and, and revisit the history of of the 1700s or the 1800s or the 1960s. I can't rewrite that. I can't, I can't fix that. All I can do is move forward from the day and try to make life better and try to make a world a better place for everybody that's in it. I, I can't, I can't fix anything that's in the past. I can't fix my past, much less anybody else's past. So um, I never look back and say what could have been. I always look back and say, this is what it was, and we were very blessed to have him. Very well said, my friend. Kyle Petty is our guest here on this bonus edition of Vibland Sports. Before we get to the camp of the charity ride, what have been some of the initiatives that you guys have helped lead going forward since Adam's uh, accident as far as safety is concerned? You know what? We worked really hard on um, on, on safer cars, on, on making the, the, the driver impact crush zones in the cars. Uh, my gosh, we worked tirelessly on, on seats. Uh, Cal Wells and those guys worked really hard and we worked in conjunction with them with carbon fiber seats and the cocoon uh, system that almost everybody is running right now. It wasn't just my, myself. It was myself, Rick Hendrick and Hendrick Motorsports, Cal Wells Motorsports. I mean, a, a group of us got together and, and really sat down and thought about it and talked through it uh, and tried to make the cars and the cockpits of the cars and what the drivers felt uh, a lot safer from helmets to Hans collars all the way through. So, um, you know, some things, some things played out the way we thought they would when, when you look at the data and some things didn't play out anything like you thought they would. So, uh, and, and listen, it's inherently a da dangerous sport. And we always had this funny, uh, safety never takes a holiday. That means safety's on duty every day, every day, safety's on duty. And you better be there with it. 
Uh, and that's the way we always look at it. One of the reasons I want to have you on, I want to uh, in, in introduce uh, a couple of things that you do to our listeners, because I was just blown away is how you guys have used the tragedy of losing your son to help other people. And the first was you founded the Kyle Petty Charity Ride Across America. It's what in its 25th year, and you've raised going on about $20 million for chronic illness for children, haven't you? Yeah, you know, we started that right before Adam's accident. We started yeah. and, and, and we're, we're riding motorcycles across country and uh, really stopping at children's hospitals and helping families pay their bills uh, because we felt like there was a huge need financially uh, for parents um, to, to be able to, to – We a child's illness shouldn't be a reason for a family to go in debt, and that's how simple it is. And, um, you know, so we, we, we did that for, for four or five years. I guess five years and then Adam's accident happened. And, uh, after his accident happened, uh, then we changed the focus and all the money went to, to bill camp. And yes, we've raised close to $20 million and, uh, given that money away. When I say that we, we not only raised it, we gave it all away. That's, that's the way it is because, uh, all the money from the charity ride, all the money from the things we do, uh, go straight into camp. We are the, uh, the largest donor at camp, the largest continual donor at camp. And, uh, we've been through the years to 20 some odd different children's hospitals from uh, Southern California to Northern California to Miami up to Maine. So uh, we've been to a lot of places across this country uh, to see kids. And now with the with with camp coming along, uh, it's just about bringing kids to us. The charity ride really marries two things uh, that are very, very special to you, riding a bike and raising money to help children. Tell us exactly about the charity ride and how it's grown over the 25 years you've, you've had it. Yeah. You know, the first year we did it, uh, we said we'd never do it again. Uh, we did it one year, one and done. We raised $35,000 and that was it. Um, and, and you know what? It, it was, it was crazy. Uh, the next year, some of the guys that went, we only had like 30 people. Some of the guys that went and said, yeah, let's do that again. You know? So there were about 15 of us and we recruited some other people and uh, it just kept growing and growing. And we got, too big and we cut back a little bit so we've been at about 110 or 15 riders uh the last few years this year we're back up to 150 we decided for the 25th year we would do that but we pick a route we just pick a route and and we head from west to east we've gone from san diego to daytona we've gone from maine to miami we've gone to uh golly traverse city michigan down to new orleans i mean we have gone so many different routes uh, a couple of years ago, we just went from Portland, Portland, Oregon, uh, or yeah, Portland, Oregon, up to uh, to Milwaukee, and Wisconsin, to the to the museum there, to the Harley Museum. So that was one of our deals. But uh, we've ridden so many different routes that now it's kind of evolved into uh, this year we're going corner to corner. We're going to, from Seattle to Key Largo. It's our longest ride ever, about 3,700 miles. It's nine days. But I tell people it's like it's like being on a cruise ship, man. You throw your luggage in a truck, you get on your motorcycle, you ride, somebody serves lunch, you pull into a gas stop, somebody pumps gas for you, you get back on a motorcycle, you end up at a hotel somewhere, your luggage is already in your room. All you got to do is worry about getting something to eat that night when you come down to the restaurant, and then we do it again the next day for nine days in a row. So how do you actually raise the money? Is it, is, is it based on the number of miles you ride, and, and do you have celebrity friends that join you on this uh, cruise? Yeah, we here's the, each rider pays a fee, uh, and out of that fee, um, that that we try to we try to find sponsors that pay along, so we get to keep their fee. That's the way it kind of works, you know what I mean? Uh, because their fee goes straight to camp. But we've got sponsors like Mannheim Auto Auction, um, Loves Travel Centers, uh, the big Loves truck stops you see along the way along the interstate. They're a huge partner of ours. Coca Cola has been a partner for 25 years. Uh, Dodge has been a partner for 25 years. Uh, golly, Harley Davidson has been a partner for 25 years. And then we have guys like Herschel Walker, George Rogers, two Heisman Trophy winners. My dad, Donnie Allison, Harry Gant, um, guy Herschel McGriff, who rode the very first, drove in the very first Darlington Southern 500 in 1950. He's 92 years old this year. He'll wow. be riding with us. Uh, so it's funny. David Reagan, who races now. Uh, and we just have a, a group of people that ride along with us. And sometimes we pick up celebrities along the way uh, for local interest stories and stuff like that that will come out and ride with us. But, um, you know, we pick up dollars and dimes and nickels, quarters, anything we can along the way. And hopefully uh, when it's all said and done, we're able to send a bunch of kids to camp. Kyle, when you started the charity ride, you said you were going to do it for one year. It's grown into now 25, raised almost $20 million. You funneled that money into your camp. 
Victory Junction camp. Let's go from the genesis of that idea, because if I remember right, you saying there were a lot of people originally that said, no, you don't want to do that. You don't want to go down that road um, expense wise with uh, helping children that have life threatening illnesses. No. Yeah. Paul's guys, Paul Newman's guys said that, um, you know, they came down when they came down and we told them what we wanted to do. They were like, yeah, you know, we don't think you, we don't think we want to be a part of it. Cause we don't believe that, you know, we don't think you guys can raise the money. And, we, and they, we said, okay. And they said, well, we're sorry. What are y'all going to do? And we said, we're going to build a camp. <laughs> and they said, yeah, but we said, we're not going to. And we, I, we said, yeah, but we didn't say we're not going to. I mean, we've been raising money our whole life just to ride around in circles. Um, you know, that's what we did. You got to go out and raise money and find sponsors for a race car just so you can go out and ride around in circles. So, you know, like I told them, what makes you think we can't raise money to do good? Cause we've not done good. We just rode around in circles. That's all we did. Um, and there were a lot of people, you know, who said, no, there's no way you guys will be able to build what you're talking about building. And, uh, you know what, we built it in about 18 months. Uh, so it's funny when people tell you no, and they, you can't, uh, how uh, a lot of people, uh, will just get their rear end on their shoulders and say, well, I'll show you, I can do it. And that's kind of what we did. And we went out and built it and it's still going strong. One of the great thing I think about NASCAR is you guys are rivals on the oval on Sunday, but you really help each other out for noble causes away from the track. And you've had a lot of support from the NASCAR community and certainly from sponsors nationwide to get victory junction junction camp going. Haven't you? Yeah. You know, and, and like I said, when we, you know, when we started the charity ride back in, in, in the mid nineties, nobody had a foundation. Really. By the time Adam's accident happened, uh, then Jeff Gordon was one of the, one of the first guys. He's like, yeah, you know, I'll donate money for a cabin. Dale Jarrett, Bobby Labonte, so many of those guys were like, yeah, our foundation will help you. You know what I mean? Um, and then when they they did, then all the Dale Jarrett fans said, well, Dale Jarrett's going to do this. I'll help him. I'll help him. And Bobby Labonte fans and Tony Stewart fans and Jimmy Johnson fans, and Dale Jr. fans, you know, and, and I think when you look at it, that's what we're not the biggest sport in the world, but we're probably the most caring, giving sport in the world. I would give them that uh, from the fans to the drivers, to the crew members, to everybody. So um, that that was a that has been and continues to be a huge, a huge part of our, our giving and a huge part of the people that make camp work. Uh, are the NASCAR fans that are out there. Kyle Petty is our guest on this bonus edition of iBland Sports, a presentation of iBland Media. Tell us and take us through a week at Victory Junction Camp. What all happens for those uh, those uh, children that attend your camp? You know what? A reg- it's, it's a week like any other camp, uh, and, and I, that's, that is what it's supposed to be. If you go to Boy Scout Camp or YMCA Camp or – or, you know, any other summer camp and you get to do arts and crafts and you get to do boating and you get to do fishing and uh, there's a pool or a lake and you can do a zip line or a ropes course. Uh, then we do the same thing, uh, but it's just in a medically safe environment. Uh, we'll have four or five doctors there most weeks, as many as 40 or 50 nurses, sometimes as many as 16 or 17 doctors. It depends on the illness that is there that week. Uh, we're, our counselor ratio is basically two counselors for every one child. We see 120 children a week in the summertime, um, but there's nothing there that a child can't do. Uh, we have special harnesses for for riding horses, special harnesses so kids can go down a zip line. If you're in a wheelchair, doesn't mean you can't go down the zip line. Uh, we're, we're good with that. We've got harnesses that we can hook you up and, and send you down. So you get to experience everything uh, at camp that's there. And and like I said, it's not it, it's funny. It's it's a hospital disguised as a camp because we have a, a medical building on the facility that we can do uh, dialysis. Uh, we can do chemo. We can do certain certain procedures there. Uh, there's always, we're within 17 minutes helicopter uh, ride from Duke University Medical Center or from Bowman Grace University Medical Center, which is Brenner's Children's Hospital. Uh, so we're close to, to a lot of medical facilities. We've never had to utilize that in all of our years, uh, knock on wood. So We've been been very, very blessed, but a typical week is like any week. It's just kids hanging out, and that's what people need to know about Victory Junction. Victory Junction is a place for kids with spina bifida, kids with Crohn's, kids with um, blood disorders, with certain forms of cancer. Uh, they go to camp with kids just like them. We see like illnesses. So if we see 120 kids, it's basically 120 kids with gastrointestinal disorders. 
Next week, if we see 100 kids, 120 kids, it's 120 kids with blood disorders from 6 to 16. So they all kind of have the same illness, um, and, and they're all alike. So that's the whole point is to put these kids with other kids so that they can look around and say, hey, I'm not the only kid that has Crohn's. I'm not the only kid that's in a wheelchair. I'm not the only kid that's been in a fire. Um, there's other kids like that out there, and I can be friends, and we can be kids, and that's what we do. And that's what camp is all about, just empowering kids to be kids. Is this the most gratifying thing you've ever done personally or professionally? Oh, yeah. Yeah, shoot, yeah. Yeah, I think it's the most gratifying thing that anybody can do is give to somebody else, um, no matter what you do. Man, if you stop on the side of the street – uh, and, and pick somebody up and, and help them to a meal or get them a hotel room for a night. Um, that's, that's one of the most gratifying things that, that anybody can do. That's what, listen, I, I know we all believe that we were put on God's green earth, uh, to make money and spend it and live in big houses and cars, and do go on vacation to Disney and do all that. Uh, but I don't believe that's what it's all about. I think it's about helping other people, uh, and, and understanding what, what it's like to be in that and having some empathy for other people. You have a lot of memories, but you shared one when you were in Oklahoma city, not too long ago, speaking, uh, about a kid that came in, wouldn't talk to anybody and just made a remarkable transformation as a person <laughs> by the time that week was over. Right. He made an, a remarkable transition back to the person that he was is, is what the story is all about. Really? Uh, we had a little boy that came and he had been burnt over 80% of his body, uh, almost 90% of his body. He could move his little finger and his thumb, and that was about it. Um, and he was so excited to be at camp. He was 12, 13 years old, so excited to be at camp. Um, but as the week, as, as more and more kids came, the excitement kind of waned a little bit because he didn't realize, I guess, that there were going to be other kids there doing the same thing. And uh, he kind of dropped back into his shell and for – the first couple of days, we had to change counselors with him two or three times. Uh, and finally, we put him with with, with Pronto, our camp director and uh, at the time. And Pronto kind of took him under his wing. And we did a thing at the time at, at, at lunch where people would come up to the front of the room and say what they were thankful for uh, into a microphone. And people would get in line. They'd say, man, I'm thankful we're having pizza today. And everybody would laugh. Or I'm thankful I'm in the yellow cabin this week. And and our people would say, I'm thankful I'm in the blue cabin. Or I'm thankful I got to swim or catch a fish for the first time. And on Wednesday, this old boy had done nothing. He hadn't ridden horses. He hadn't really done archery. He hadn't done arts and crafts. He had just kind of set off to the side by himself and watched. And uh, He got up to the front of the room and uh, finally everybody got quiet. And he said that he was thankful that there was a camp like this for everybody. And everybody kind of was, you know, kind of looked and, then, then he said, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that no matter how we, we were burned, because this was during burn week, how, how we were burned, that we all survived. And those are powerful words from, from a 12 or 13 year old kid, uh, that, that sees the world bigger than just himself, that sees other kids. And, uh, Wednesday night at camp is, uh, we do a thing for the older kids. It's a little bit of a dance night in the, in the gymnasium where we play music and everybody just kind of hangs out. And, uh, the last thing he said, can I say something else? And, Pronto said, yeah, he said, I've been watching everybody. I hadn't really done anything. And I've noticed there's some pretty good looking burnt chicks here. And I'm going to hook up with one tonight. <laughs> and for the rest of the week, this kid was out of control, out of control. I mean, everything he didn't do Monday and Tuesday and, and, and up until lunchtime Wednesday, he wanted to ride horses. He wanted to be in the swimming pool. He wanted to do arts and crafts. Uh, he wanted to do everything. And when his mom came and picked him up, she left and she came back about 30 minutes later and she found Pronto and she told Pronto, she said, thank you. Thank you for giving me back the little boy uh, that that he is. This is the little boy he was when he was nine years old and when his accident happened. But for the for the last three or four years, he had just gone somewhere else uh, and just retreated inside of himself uh, and had gotten quiet and pensive and just been somebody else. But she said when she picked him up, it was that nine year old twinkle in his eye and that little boy was back. And to this day, she still comes to camp and volunteers for a week so that other children can experience that same thing. That is such a remarkable story. Has this thing become bigger than you could have ever envisioned, Kyle? Because oh, I, know, yeah. I know you've served over 20,000 kids and, and you did say at one point you've had them now from all 50 states. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And listen, so much bigger, so much bigger. I, I tell people I laugh all the time. The first year we saw 600 kids total. And we were afraid we were going to lose one every day, uh, that they were going to disappear on us, that they were going to hide and run away or do something. We just didn't want sure we could control them. Um, but it, it, it is so, so much bigger 
and I, and I tell people all the time too, you know, when you see, see the photos of camp and you see the kids there or see the photos and stuff, you, you have a tendency. And I think we all do to pat yourself on the back and say, man, look at what we built. This is great. Look at what we did. Um, uh, and then you see the kids come and, and you don't even notice the buildings. We could have put up tents. Uh, we could have just plowed a field. It wouldn't have made any difference. As long as the kids are there, that's what it's all about. It's not about what we do. It's about what they do. How can people find out more about Victory Junction Camp and, and how maybe can they send uh, their child to be a part of it? Yes. It, you, you go to victoryjunction.org. It's not .com. It's .org. Victoryjunction.org. Uh, and if you have a child or know a child that can come to camp, please uh, look up the camp recruiters, call them, contact them through email. They will get back in touch with you ASAP. Uh, if you can't come during the summer, we'll get you there on a weekend. We'll work something. Uh, so, I mean, there's so many different ways from volunteerism to donations at camp. Uh, but we, we, every child that comes to camp takes home a teddy bear. Every child that comes to camp takes home uh, a little a little quilt uh, that, that people have made for us. So we're always taking quilt donations, always taking teddy bear donations, uh, things like that. But time is, is the most important thing. We get people come from all over the country that volunteer for a week or volunteer for a weekend. And that means more then you'll ever know a check is one thing, but time is priceless. Kyle, I so appreciate you visiting with us on this bonus edition of Ibland Sports. You've got a great story, and what you are doing for uh, sick kids is just just remarkable, and I think that's a great legacy beyond anything you've done with racing. Again, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for helping us get the word out. Kyle Petty, visiting with us here on this bonus edition of Ibland Sports. We'll be back to wrap it up in just a moment. And a very special thanks to Kyle Petty for joining us on this edition of the bonus podcast from Vibland Sports. Once again, if you're interested in a camp schedule to donate or to volunteer, please visit victoryjunction.org. On behalf of everyone here at Vibland Sports, thanks for listening. I'm Todd Miller.